energetic then. Now, before our discussion tonight, judges from the East African Court of Justice are converging in Nairobi for this year's annual conference. Now, the EASCJ is an international court tasked with resolving disputes involving the East African community and its member states and is charged with interpreting and enforcing the treaty, which came into force on July 7, 2000. The conference was officially opened by Kenya's Chief Justice David Maraga, the court's president, Justice Dr. Emmanuel Ogirasha Buja. I hope I got that right. And they said this year's conference will focus on reviewing the court's strategies with a view to achieving on its mandate. Today we begin our, what we call our retreat. Uh, we have a biannual retreat for judges uh, where we discuss quite a number of issues. Uh, if you look at the agenda today, we look at the rules of procedure for the court. These rules have uh, been there for now five years. But you all understand after five years, after you, the experience that you gain as a court, you do require to look at the way you conduct business in the court. So this is the reason why today we are going to look at the uh, rules of procedure. Then we will have a, a plenary which, is, which brings together the whole court uh, to, look, to chart the way forward for the court basing on the experience that we've had so far as a court. So that is why we do meet in these retreats. Now, the East African Court of Justice is an international court tasked with resolving disputes involving the East African community and its member states. The ESCJ was established by Article 9 of the Treaty for the Establishment of the East African Community and is charged with interpreting and enforcing the treaty, which came into force on July 7, 2000. Tonight, to discuss with me the mandate, perhaps the challenges and the success of the court since its inception, I'm joined in studio by Honorable Yufnalis Okubu, who is the registrar of the East African Court of Justice Justice, and Mr. Bonfez Ogoti, who is a senior court clerk, the East African Court of Justice, as well as Simon Twenty, who is a Ugandan and is a senior court clerk from the sub registry of, of uh, Kampala, Uganda. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the program. Yes, good okay. evening. Honorable Yufnalis, let me begin with you. Perhaps so many people who are watching don't know what this court is all about. Perhaps can you kick off our discussion tonight by telling us uh, what perhaps is the role of this uh, court. I know it has the judicial role, but can you break it down for us? Okay, thank you. First of all, uh, this court is the judicial arm of the East African community. Look at East African community as a bigger government with the legislative arm, the East African Legislative Assembly, with the judiciary arm, that the East African Court of Justice, and the secretariat, which is like the executive. So. Mm -hmm. The East African Court of Justice is the judicial arm. And as you've said in the introductory, it deals mainly with interpretation and application of the treaty. Now, what do I mean by that? It means the treaty has certain provisions, and where any citizen of the community feels there's a breach of that treaty, there's a violation of the provision of the treaty, then it's at liberty to come to the court. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, are, we, we have had many cases, both from Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, even South Sudan that joined the community just recently, bringing mm -hmm. their cases to the, uh, to the regional court in Arusha for the court to make a decision or, on the matters that they feel there is a breach of the treaty. Yes. Now, now, allow me to engage Bonfess. Now, Bonfess, from what Honorable Yufnalis have said, to me, it seems this court has a very important role, especially in the <coughs> integration process. But the main question is, why is the court, you know, why does it seem like the, the court is not visible? Uh, thank you very much. The court is not visible, but we are making, uh, we are trying to make it visible mm -hmm. by engaging our stakeholders. And uh, we are doing that First of all, we did that by opening sub-registries in the partner states. Mm -hmm. We have uh, sub-registries in all the capitals of the, the, the East African community, uh, of the partner states of the East African community. So, in fact, uh, uh, we had also started uh, moving around, having what we call circuit courts, mm -hmm. where the court would move and go and hear cases uh, where litigants come from that same partner state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Both litigants, the applicant and the respondent come from the, same, from the partner state. So the court would move there so that the citizens of that partner state or the regional would know the existence of the court. So are you saying there are mobile courts within the East African Court of Justice? 
Yes, we are, we, we are trying to move out so that mm -hmm. uh, uh, people can uh, at least know that the court exists. Mm -hmm. yeah. now, now, Simon, apart from visibility, let's talk about you know, accessibility of, this, of these courts. You know, there are critics out there, and you have the chance to clear the air for us this once and for all. There are critics out there saying that, you know, this court is not accessible. Perhaps do you have sub-registries? I know you are the clerk of the Kampala sub-registry, for instance. Are there other sub-registries within the region? Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are five uh, sub-registries yes. in the five uh, partner states. We have a sub-registry in uh, Nairobi here. We have uh, a sub-registry in Kampala, mm -hmm. Uganda. We have a sub-registry in Chigali, Rwanda. And we have a sub-registry in uh, Bujumbura. Mm -hmm. in, uh, then we have, lastly, a sub-registry in uh, Dar es Salaam. So the whole region is well covered. Yeah, it is uh, well there. covered. Mm -hmm. Now, now, honorable journalists, now this brings uh, about the question of, you know, the effectiveness of this court as the registrar of this very important court. Perhaps can you tell our viewers uh, the numbers of the cases you've already filed? Because, you know, there are critics once again saying that, for example, between the year 2001 and 2005, you've not recorded a single case or filed a single case, for example. Well, 2001 and 2005, remember, the court had just been inaugurated in 2001. Mm -hmm. And it took us about five years to have our first case. That, to me, is not bad. If you look at the European court, it stayed for 15 years without a single case. So for us, just five years before we get our first case, to me, I think that one we did very well. At mm -hmm. least the residents were aware of the, of the existence of the court and what they can bring into that court. Mm -hmm. Even uh, linked to that, I can even mention the issue of, of access to these courts. And like some other international courts, with us you can come direct. Mm -hmm. You don't need to file cases in Kenya, for example, lose in the High Court, go in the Court of Appeal, lose there, go maybe the Supreme Court, lose there, and then come to East African Court of Justice. No, you can come direct. Mm -hmm. And we are even open, we say, any resident in the community, as opposed to citizen, so, so long as you are in the, within the six partner states and you are legally there, even if you are not a citizen of them, you can access the courts. And we do have very many different people coming there, we even NGOs coming there, governments themselves also bringing cases there. Mm -hmm. So the really access is there. Maybe it needs to be upscaled. But uh, for five years without a case, mm -hmm. that was not bad compared to a bigger court and where where, where uh, knowledge is more, is more uh, level of illiteracy is high, like the European court that stayed for 15 years. Mm -hmm. without so basically, basically you're saying the court is effective, right? The court is effective mm -hmm. as far as compared to, if you look at it in terms of uh, how long it has also been in existence, mm -hmm. it is effective. Allow me to talk to Bonfess once again. Now, Bonfess, apparently uh, you have about 11 judges in the court and uh, two judges represent each member uh, country. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and uh, they serve on temporary basis, right? So there are those who are saying that the court could have been much more effective, perhaps, if these judges were allowed to operate on a permanent basis rather than temporary. True, true. Th th that is a fact because uh, uh, this idea of having a, an ad hoc nature of judge judges is uh, somehow affecting the court, especially for the first instance division where we have a, 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 a big number of cases. So uh, as we talk of now, we have received, so far we have received like uh, 280 uh, uh, cases. And uh, that is uh, maybe 130 substantive cases in the first instance division and 150 uh, 130 substantive cases and 150 applications. Mm -hmm. So I would say that uh, maybe to start with, we can have the first instance division being permanent in Arusha because we are beginning to see what we call a backlog of, uh, of cases. Yes. At the moment, we have like uh, maybe 31 references pending in the first instance division. And uh, we would, uh, for example, a litigant who filed a case maybe in uh, uh, one and a half years ago, uh, expected his case to be heard maybe after th within three months, only uh, for it to be heard maybe uh, one and a half years, to begin one and a half years later. Mm -hmm. So we would uh, 
uh, maybe to start with have the first instance division being permanent so that we don't have this uh, backlog of, of cases. Yes. And maybe the appellate division later, yes. where we don't have many, many cases at the moment. So Bonfest, you agree with those critics who are saying that you know this court needs permanent uh, judges, right? Yeah, we need permanent judges mm -hmm. and also the term of judges also needs to be looked at. Let me, let me get Simon now. Simon, you're coming from one of the sub-registries that is in Kampala. Perhaps which kind of cases do you file there and how do you link the sub-registry with the main court? I believe the main court sits in Arusha, Tanzania. Uh, we receive all various types of cases. Uh, we get uh, references, applications, uh, event case stated, we have, we had one arbitration, so all the cases, we received them, and how we transmit them to Arusha, uh, we have an e-filing, mm -hmm. when we receive a case, we see whether the case comply with the rules of procedure, then we give it a number which is a serial number that we generate electronically from Arusha, mm -hmm. then we scan now, as we scan, it's just a matter of a click of a button. The case is already in Arusha. Mm -hmm. The registrar is in position to know that this particular case has been received from Kampala or from Chigali or from Bujumbura. Then, as this case moves electronically, we also keep a hard copy that we send to Arusha. That is how we remit cases from the sub-registries to the main registry in Arusha. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well said. Now, Honorable Yufnalis, I'd like to hear this from you. Perhaps is there a political will, is there political will from, you know, the member states, bearing in mind that, you know, the East African community has countries, for example, like Burundi, where the leader there, Nkuruziza, has decided to stay on power. So, as much as you're going to tell us some of the challenges the court is fairly, uh, facing, do you get enough funding? Because this is something, something that is also affecting the East African community as well. Goodwill, I'll tell you, it is there. Mm -hmm. But uh, don't look at it in terms of that uh, because there is goodwill, we have, we have everything perfect the first day. It's incremental, we improve as we keep going. The issue of finance, I think it runs across. Uh, I, I'm yet to come across uh, any institution that says it has enough finance. Mm -hmm. But what I'll tell you, our partner says are doing whatever they can within their reach to support us. Mm -hmm. Is it, it may, sufficient, for example? Let me put it that way. In the circumstances, it is sufficient, mm -hmm. considering that also the sessions of the court are not permanent. The, the judges come on an ad hoc basis. Maybe if tomorrow we wake up and uh, our heads of state decide that now the court becomes permanent, then, of course, they'll have to relook into the budget. Mm -hmm. But I think there is sufficient goodwill for the courts. Yes. That is why also the public are getting confidence in the court. We are having many cases uh, coming to the court, and you'll be surprised where you get, for instance, uh, 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 two government institutions suing one another in our court. It means they have confidence in the courts. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, uh, this is a question that I'm going to pose to both you and Bonfess, but let me begin with Bonfess uh, for now. Now, Bonfess, we've talked about the role, perhaps the mandate, you know, of, of, of this court, the East African Court of Justice. Perhaps can you tell our viewers some of the success story coming out of your court? Yeah, the success story, I would say that the court has developed quite some jurisprudence that is even being cited uh, uh, in the continent. And also, it has contributed much to the integration process. First of all, if you look at uh, uh, its role in interpret inter interpretation and application of the treaty, it has been interpreting and applying the treaty in several instances. and. Uh, we would uh, maybe like a, a case, an example where now we have the famous case in the, in the, in, in the court, the Anyang Nyong case. The Professor Anyang Nyong was, uh, that was related to uh, representatives from Kenya uh, elected to the East African Leg Legislative Assembly. Mm -hmm. That is uh, one case that the court uh, handled, uh, injuncted an organ of the community, uh, and uh, the, 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 the partner state that was Kenya uh, had, in the conclusion of the matter, had to comply with the, the decision of the court. Mm -hmm. So we can see uh, 
partner states uh, uh, implementing decisions of the court. As much as we don't have enforcement mechanisms, which we shall deal with later mm -hmm. on as one of the challenges, uh, but uh, partner states have uh, uh, implemented our decisions, and that is one of those milestones that the court has uh, achieved. Yes, I'd like to hear Yufnal's view on the same. To add on what Bonfaz has said, there are really some landmark cases that uh, are always quoted all over. I'll give you one example of the, we had a case called the African Network of Animal Welfare. Mm -hmm. The African Network of Animal Welfare is an NGO in Kenya, but it sued the government of Tanzania. Why? Because the government of Tanzania had planned to build a road, a tarmac road across the Serengeti. Mm -hmm. Now, this NGO came to court saying, look, if you put up this road across Serengeti, then you are going to interfere with the natural movement of the wild beast. Mm -hmm. And this movement of wild beasts is a natural resource which is shared between Kenya and Tanzania. And the court had the case and stopped the Tanzanian government from constructing the road. And that project was just killed at that level. Mm -hmm. That is a landmark case. Sometimes we get calls, we get emails from all environmental uh, organizations all over the world wanting to know about this case, more about this case. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, you know, in uh, litigation, uh, when today you win, you praise the court. When tomorrow you lose, you say the court is bad. Uh, those are challenges that are, you will experience in all cases. Mm -hmm. But those are some of the jurisprudence that this court has really developed and they are uh, cited throughout uh, Africa, throughout the world. Yes. And uh, Simon, and you finally feel free to answer this question as well later. One of our viewers here, Simon, is asking, can the court adjudicate on disputes concerning violation of human rights? Is it something that, you know, is under your jurisdiction as well? Um, I, I think, yes, court has handled cases that are related to human rights though it is not directly stipulated. Mm -hmm. And then that question specifically, maybe I will ask the registrar to mm -hmm. throw more light. I, I thought so, I that. thought so, but I wanted yeah. you to have a bite on it. But uh, yeah. definitely, can, you, can I play back that question to you uh, I, I, once again from our viewer here, viewer who is, who is asking, can the court adjudicate on disputes concerning violation of human rights? If, so long as that violation is a breach of the treaty, mm -hmm the court will adjudicate, and it has done that before. If you can come and say what this has done or what this government has done is a violation of the treaty, the court will hear it. And if you look at uh, the provision of the treaty, there are certain principles which the partner states have undertaken, have undertook that they will abide by. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, adherence to the rule of law, uh, democracy, yes. uh, governance, good governance, uh, social justice, and the uh, principles of human rights. So if you can come and say country A or country B has violated any of this, the court will hear you. Mm -hmm. And even if you look at uh, a provision like uh, the rule of law, mm -hmm. it's really very wide, very, very wide. You can almost fit in anything in the rule of law and come and challenge that action by, 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 by a government in, yes. in, the, in the East African Court of Justice. Yes, and, and you, you finally, uh, one final question before I head over to Boniface. I understand the African Union also has its own judicial uh, you know, system in place. How do you ensure that you know, these two bodies uh, don't duplicate their roles, for, for instance? First of all, African uh, Union, the African Court, uh, which is based in Arusha, mm -hmm. is continental. Yes. It covers the whole, uh, the whole of Africa, members of our African Union. Now, the procedures of accessing that court are very different from the procedures of accessing East African Court of Justice. So that is why you'll find uh, maybe some people will prefer to come to the East African Court of Justice. Others, maybe who are, me who are not members of ESC, mm -hmm. will prefer to go to that court. But uh, that, uh, our roles are more complementary than, uh, than a duplication of, uh, of exercises. Because here we have one court covering countries of East African community, and here you have another court covering the whole of Africa, members of African Union. Mm -hmm. So it's more complementary. Yes, Honorable Yufnalis, I think that will serve as your final comment on the show. Now, Bonfes, as you make your final remarks, how does the future of the East African Court of Justice look like? Because we understand the East African community itself has, you know, its own fair share of, of challenges. So how does the future of this court look like? Uh, maybe before I go to the future, I would mm -hmm. like also to 
add on uh, what uh, his worship, the registrar, has said on the issue of uh, whether the court has uh, the human rights jurisdiction. And uh, the court does not have that jurisdiction per se, but parties have found a way, or the treaty provides that uh, uh, under Article 6D, that uh, partner states should uh, uh, abide by those fundamental principles. And uh, this issue of uh, the jurisdiction on human rights have, has always come up where the attorneys generals have objected to some of the matters before the court uh, on grounds that the court does not have jurisdiction because the court does not have human rights jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. But the court has ruled in one of the, in some cases, uh, especially with the first case that was uh, James Katabazi and 21 and others uh, versus uh, Attorney General of Uganda and the Secretary General, where it says that it cannot abdicate its jurisdiction of interpreting and applying the treaty just because an issue of human rights has been dropped in. Because Article 6D says that it, uh, they, they, shall, they agree to comply with the fundamental principles of uh, human rights as provided for in the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Mm -hmm. So uh, the partner states, uh, litigants have found a way of coming through that uh, Article 6D mm -hmm. and 7.2. But again, uh, on the, coming back to the issue of uh, the future of the, of the court, mm -hmm. I would say that the future of the court is very bright. And uh, we are seeing a situation where uh, uh, what we call uh, litigants and uh, residents of the community are gaining confidence in this court mm -hmm. and uh, are bringing more matters to the court. In, in the beginning, we had many cases coming from Kenya. Right now, we have many from, from, from Uganda and Burundi. So even from, from South Sudan, as the registrar has said. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing a bright future of the court, and uh, we are looking forward to see what, what is going to happen. Thanks, Boniface, for that generous comment. And I think we're almost out of time there. And I think that should be the final word uh, for our discussion tonight. Many thanks, Boniface Sogoti, for your input. He's a senior court clerk from the East African Court of Justice, as well as Honorable Yufnalis Okubu is the registrar of the court, as well as Simon Twenty, who's a senior court clerk from the Kampala sub